you how the bankers are really doing you in. One of the things that people don't really understand, and Mr. Greenspan made it very clear in this lecture that he gave that I referenced earlier, is that we guarantee the balance sheets of the banks. All of you folks in, the, in this room, here in the room, all of us around the country, we guarantee their balance sheets. Their assets are protected systemically by the so-called lender of last resort of the Federal Reserve, and their liabilities are protected by, at the micro level by what they call federal deposit insurance, which is not insurance, it's just a subsidy. So the metaphor that I like, suppose I tell you folks, we're going to play poker, and we're going to play like this. If you uh, play the game, if you win, you keep your winnings. If you lose, the taxpayers will give you more money. Well, who wouldn't play in a game like that? And what's the stop, you say, for pulling to an inside straight against three showing? And the answer is regulation. Someone's going to stand over your shoulder and say, pulling to an inside straight against three showing is a nutty bet, don't do it. So what do the banks do? They make off-table bets. Think off-balance sheets, you know, special investment vehicles. But the really big uh, uh, elephant in the room, go to the next slide, please, is something they call derivatives. And derivatives are just bets. These are bets that the banks make. There's an organization in the world that's called the Bank for International Settlements. That's an umbrella group for the, uh, for, for the banks around the planet. And they collect the data on the bets that the banks have made uh, on these derivative bets. And as of June of last year, it's up to $684 trillion. Now, what's the business purpose for banks making $684 trillion worth of bets? Now, again, if they win these bets, they keep the money. If they lose these bets, we have to replenish their balance sheets, as we are doing right now. And go to the next slide, please. This shows the year-on-year -year increase in these derivative bets. And even though they tell us that they're deleveraging, in the first half of 2008, they increased by $88 trillion. And I say, is this reckless and irresponsible? And the reason I use that phrase is because Greenspan raised it himself. He said, since they know that we're going to bail them, he said, we don't want them to engage in reckless and irresponsible behavior. And so I raised the issue at that, at that time, at, uh, at which time the uh, derivative bets totaled $66 trillion. I said, well, how do we know when it gets to reckless and irresponsible? Is $100 trillion reckless and irresponsible? Today it's close to $700 trillion. And go to the next slide, please. And one of the consequences of this, and some spin you get from Wall Street, uh, and again, this affects everybody in this room and all the people in Montana, this whole notion is, is that you save for the future with your IRAs, uh, 401ks, uh, that we have the ownership society, people investing in stocks and whatnot. You recall that President Bush wanted to privatize Social Security. Well, it turns out that the equity markets uh, in the United States are now down by half. And so just when you have 66 million baby boomers about to retire, their 401ks, their IRAs, the whole thing is just melting away at them, again, as a result of the irredeemable paper ticket money. And go to the next slide, please. This is a, a, a chart that comes from Bloomberg. And they have an index that tracks the uh, worldwide uh, value of all the equities. It peaked at March of 2008 at roughly 60 trillion. Uh, as of this morning, it's roughly 26 trillion, down to nearly 35 trillion dollars. I mean, this is stunning. And so what's happening, folks, is that all of the savings that people have uh, uh, for their retirement is all melting away right now. So one of the questions you might ask, and this, this really talks to your bill, well, how can you protect yourself? And I think everybody in this room and everybody in this country has a moral obligation to protect themselves and their families best. And go to the next slide, please. And the best from Jim Turk, I've checked it. It turns out that at any time uh, in the last eight years, if you bought gold at the beginning of the year, at the end of the year, you had more money. And on average, for the last eight years, you were up 16%. No down years. Now, if Wall Street had a product, had a mutual fund that was up every year for the last eight years, given what's happened, and on average up 16%, don't you think you'd have full page ads, say, in Fortune magazine, Business Week, on the Wall Street Journal? But Wall Street does not want you to buy gold. And the reason is, Wall Street is a fee business. And at its peak, just the money management part alone, not counting transaction fees, the money management alone worldwide got something like $500 billion in fees. Whereas if you buy gold, they get a fee one time and then it stops. So they demonize gold. And go to the next slide, please. And this shows the average appreciation for the last eight years in all the major currencies of the U.S. dollar, the Australian dollar, the Canadian dollar, the Chinese yen, the euro, the Indian rupee, the Japanese yen, the Swiss franc, 
and the British pound, these, uh, by, during this eight year period, some of these uh, currencies had minor uh, decreases, but all over the world, irredeemable paper ticket money is coming under attack and it's losing all its value. But again, gold is the way to protect yourself. And go to the next slide, please. So how is it that all this massive malfeasance, this fraud, this outright theft, was able to reach such large proportions? Why didn't our national elected representatives protect us? Why didn't they uphold and protect the Constitution as they've all promised to do? And go to the next slide, please. This shows the campaign contributions just from the financial sector. And of the last, uh, uh, 1998, 2008, came to $1.7 billion. This is campaign contributions. Now, some of you will recall Huey Long from uh, Louisiana. Huey Long had this saying that the difference between a large campaign contribution and a bribe was as thin as a hair. Well, actually, he was wrong. There is no difference. So, in effect, the financial guys have bought off our elected representatives. And go to the next slide, please. And more important than the campaign contribution, they spent over $3.4 billion lobbying for special privilege for themselves, special, uh, special guarantees, special bailouts and whatnot. And this is, does not include support personnel. This just includes uh, uh, people who had contact with the elected representatives themselves. Uh, this data comes from the Center for Responsive Politics. And go to the next slide, please. And look how much money these guys got. I mean, it is unfathomable. So you go back to 1980, the money supply is roughly $2 trillion. The market cap of the S&P 500, these are the 500 most valuable publicly traded companies, was a $1 trillion. And the financial sector component of that, you can't even see it on the chart, it was 5%, just $50 billion. And you zip ahead to 2005, and now the money supply has grown from $2 trillion up to $10 trillion. Again, all created flat out of nothing by the banks. And now the market cap of the S&P 500 is $10 trillion. But now, the financial sector component to that is 23%. So the value of their companies went from $50 billion to $2.3 trillion. Now think of stock options. Think of all the wealth that went to these people. And go to the next slide, please. And people were sanguine about this because the statements that they're getting from Merrill Lynch, from uh, Lehman Brothers, from Ben Stearns, from Goldman Sachs, it looks like they're all making money. And so the spin that you got from Wall Street is that this was wealth creation. It's not wealth creation. It's just ink on paper. And go to the next slide, please. And this shows the, uh, the uh, revenues that went to the New York Stock Exchange member firms. It peaked out at something like $340 billion. This comes from the Securities Industry Association. Half of this is paid out in compensation. And so you had kids, like 20-some-odd-year-old kids, pulling down billions of dollars a year. You had last year with these hedge fund guys. Ed Griffin. Is leaving the meeting. What happened? <laughs> you know, over, you know, the 10 guys who made over a billion dollars in compensation for themselves. And they, they made so much money, they didn't even know what to do with it. And go to the next slide, please. This is a slide, I'm not picking on Richard Fold for any particular reason. Uh, he was the CEO chairman of Lehman Brothers. This is his house. I mean, it looks, it looks like a hotel. So these guys, they're buying 40,000 foot houses all around the planet, uh, $200 million airplanes, spend another $100 million outfitting these planes with hot tubs and saunas on the plane. Imagine having a plane with a hot tub and a sauna. Uh, they're buying 400 foot boats. There was an article in the major media a couple of years ago. These five bankers go out to eat and spend $62,000 for a meal. And how do you spend $62,000 for a meal? Well, it turns out they had four bottles of wine for $15,000 a bottle. And go to the next slide, please. And look what happened to bank revenues as a result of breaking the last link to golf. So bank revenues peaked out at something like $550 billion. Now, what is the product or service that you get from banks? that they should make so much revenue. And by the way, half of this money went to pay compensation. And go to the next slide, please. And this shows the profits of the banks after the compensation. So it peaked out at something like $130 million. To give you a feel for how much money that is, that's more than the gross amount that we got from the car industry. But from the car industry, we got 20 million cars. From the banks, you got canceled checks and bank statements. Go to the next slide, please. 